Today, I'll show you how to set up and install this 5.2.4 Dolby Atmos Klipsch Reference Premiere Mark II home theater. Two thirds of you shared that you do not have a dedicated theater room. So I wanted to make a comprehensive step-by-step -step video on how to set up a home theater in a living room environment. I wanna give a big thanks to Clips and Pioneer for sending this system in for review and for sponsoring this video. Now in this video, we'll cover how to connect the speakers to the AV receiver, how to set up eARC, which is the enhanced audio return channel so that we can send sound from your TV apps like Netflix, Hulu, and Disney Plus to the receiver and then out to your home theater speakers. I'll also show you how to connect your sources like an Apple TV, a gaming console, or even a 4K player to your AVR. We'll go through all the cables that you're gonna need for the installation, and I'll even share some really cool tips and tricks along the way for both beginner and veteran home theater enthusiasts. So be sure to stay till the end of this video. Now, all of the speakers, as well as the equipment mentioned in this video, I'll have them linked down in the description below. I'll also have links to an unboxing and an overview video, videos on how to level match your speaker and calibrate using both Dirac as well as Odyssey. Needless to say, there will be a lot of resources down in the description, so be sure to check them out at the end of the video. Let's take a look at the speakers and equipment that we'll be installing in this home theater setup. Today we'll be setting up a 5.2.4 Dolby Atmos home theater system. What that means is we have five bed layer speakers. That's our front left speaker, center channel, and a right speaker, plus two surround speakers. The point two refers to the two subwoofers which will handle the low bass frequencies. And the point four refers to the four Dolby Atmos enabled speakers. These will provide an immersive sound and overhead sound effects. The Klipsch RP8060FA Mark II floor standing speakers will be used for our left and right speakers. These will serve as two separate speakers in this surround sound system. The one inch tweeter and two eight inch woofers on the front of the cabinet will be used as our main left and right speakers. If we look at the top, we'll see that they also have up-firing speakers built into the cabinet. The speakers on top will be used as up-firing Dolby Atmos enabled speakers. For the center channel, we'll be using the Reference Premier 504C Mark II. For surrounds, we have the RP600M2 bookshelf speakers on 32 inch mono price speaker stands. At the very top, we have the RP500SA2 up-firing Dolby Atmos enabled speakers. Now these speakers are super versatile and they have multiple ways that you can install them. The first option is to mount them on your walls near or slightly above ear level as your side surrounds or your surround back speakers. The second option is to mount them higher on your walls and use them as your height speakers for immersive formats like Dolby Atmos, DTSX, and Oro 3D. The third option is to use them as up-firing Dolby Atmos enabled speakers. Now this is how we'll be installing them in my living room. For this option, you would place the speaker on top of another speaker, firing up at your ceiling, pointed towards your main listening position. That sound would then reflect off the ceiling and bounce down towards you. Now you may not have the ability or even the desire to mount in ceiling or on ceiling speakers in your setup. Maybe you're renting, maybe you just have a hot attic like I do here in Florida. This is exactly why upfiring Atmos modules were created. Now, although upfiring speakers can work well under the right circumstances, just realize that you could get a much more immersive experience if you're willing or able to install on ceiling, in ceiling, or height speakers. But as you can see, I don't have anywhere that I can mount them to the walls since we have an open floor plan and a large sliding glass door. So for this install, we'll be placing them on top of the RP600M Mark II surrounds and we'll be using them as up-firing Dolby Atmos enabled speakers. Now these are designed to fit on top of towers like the RP8000F version 2 
that do not have built-in Dolby Atmos upfiring speakers. The Atmos modules come with two color-coded speaker cables and plug into the top of the RP8000F2 speakers. Then internally, there's a speaker cable that runs down to the bottom of the speaker to an Atmos speaker terminal that you would use to connect to your AVR. Now, I think that's pretty slick and it keeps the cables nice and clean. Now, the 500SA Mark IIs are a bit longer than the RP600M Mark IIs, but the rubber feet fit within the width of the speaker, so we shouldn't have to worry about them falling off. Looking at the back of the RP500SA II speakers, if you want to mount them on the wall as height or surround speakers, make sure the toggle switch is set to surround. The only time that you're gonna to need to change that to Atmos is if you're using them as an up-firing Atmos speaker like we have in this setup. Wall installation is super simple by using this keyhole bracket. If you're mounting them on your walls, you'll wanna install something secure like toggle bolts rather than a drywall anchor that could work its way out over time and cause your speaker to fall to the floor. Don't ask me how I know this. With your toggle bolt installed into the wall, simply slide the screw into this keyhole slot to mount the speaker to your wall. Klipsch has already installed rubber feet to keep the speaker from scratching your walls or speakers that they may be sitting on. We'll also be installing a pair of Klipsch SPL120 12 inch subwoofers along my front wall to handle the bass frequencies. This entire system will be connected and powered by a 9.2 channel Pioneer Elite VSX LX505 AVR. So with this AVR, you can power up to nine speakers in a variety of configurations, and you can also connect two subwoofers directly to it. For sources, we'll be connecting an Apple TV 4K, a PS5 gaming console, and using a Hisense U7H TV for our streaming services. Regardless of what brand of speakers, TV, or AVR you're using in your home theater, almost everything that I share with you in this video will still be applicable. So be sure to stick around to the very end. Now we'll connect all of our speaker cables to each speaker. For cables, I'm using very affordable 14 gauge monoprice speaker cables and Sewell banana plugs to make the install easier. Now you'll notice on these speaker wires, one wire is black and the other wire is red. On the back of each speaker, you'll have a positive red terminal and a negative black terminal. Now, if your speaker wire isn't color coded red and black, it likely has a small line or writing down one side of the wire. To keep things simple, I've just always used the side with the line or the writing as the positive red cable and the other as the negative black connection. Now, truthfully, it doesn't matter which side you're using for negative and positive, just make sure it's the same connection on both the side of the speaker as well as on the side of the AVR or amplifier that you're connecting it to. Now, I've always made it known that I'm a huge fan of banana plugs. Now, banana plugs don't increase the sound quality. They just make it super convenient to be able to connect your cables to your speakers, AV receiver, or amplifier as well as ensure that you don't have any loose copper wires that could potentially create a short and fry your components. Now, I really like these Sewell banana plugs. They're super affordable, incredibly easy to install, and they keep everything nice and tidy. So the first thing you'll need to do is use wire strippers to remove about an inch, maybe an inch and a half, of the jacket around the speaker wire. You can then separate the two wires and then strip each one of those maybe about a half an inch. Unscrew the top of the banana plug, feed the speaker wire through the bottom, fold each strand of copper over the T, just kind of spreading it around in a circle, and then screw back on the tip. Give the wire a tug to make sure that it's secured properly. Once you have the banana plug installed on your speaker cable, slide the banana plugs into the speaker terminals making sure to match up the red banana plug to the red speaker terminal and the black banana plug to the black speaker terminal. Now here's a pro tip for you. If your speaker terminals look like they do not have a place to insert the banana plugs, get a really small screwdriver. 
and try prying very gently, very easily, remove the plugs from the speaker terminals. You're welcome. Now, if you choose not to use banana plugs, simply twist the speaker wire so that you don't have any stray copper wires, feed that wire up through the hole in the binding post and tighten down the speaker terminal. Repeat this process for all the remaining speakers. Now, if we look at the rear of the RP8060FA towers that we'll be using for our left and right speakers, you'll notice that we have three sets of binding posts. Now, this may look confusing at first, but I promise it's really simple. The top binding posts are labeled height. This is connected internally to the up firing height speaker that's built into the top of the speaker cabinet. So we'll connect one pair of speaker cables to the top height speaker terminals and connect it to our AVR later on in the video. You'll also notice on the bottom, there's two additional pair of speaker terminals. Now those are joined with speaker wires or what I call jumpers. You'll notice the left pair is labeled L for lows and the right is labeled H for highs. Some people like to remove these jumpers and connect the L side to an external amplifier to power the two woofers that are on the front of the speaker and then connect the R side to another channel on the external amplifier to power the tweeter that's at the top of the speaker. Now this is referred to as bi-amping. Now we won't cover bi-amping or bi-wiring in this video, but I've linked a great article from Audio Advice that explains what it is and how you connect your speakers in the description below if you choose to do that in your setup. Now, if you do choose to bi-amp or bi-wire your speakers, just make sure that you first remove that jumper that connects the two sets of binding posts. Now, some speakers like these will use a thin metal jumper to connect the two pair of speaker terminals. Now, I personally have never heard a difference when bi-amping speakers, so I always just leave the jumper intact and simply connect my speaker cable to one of the two binding posts. It really doesn't matter which one you connect it to. I'm just gonna go ahead and connect it right here. Now, if your room has carpet, you can tuck the speaker wires between the carpet and the baseboards using a flathead screwdriver. Now, if you have tile or hardwood floors like I have in my living room, you really can't run the speakers around the edges, so you may have to result to placing rugs or maybe even using something like this ghost wire from Sewell. They also have some matching terminal blocks that are pretty slick as well. Now this type of speaker wire just sticks to your wall and it's paintable. Once you have all your speaker wires connected to your speakers, one thing that you might wanna do is label them on the end that's gonna be connected to the receiver. Since we've got so many speakers that are gonna be plugged into the back, this just makes it really easy on the install process. One thing I've done over the years is just take a simple label, like an Avery label, and then wrap it around the speaker wire, and then just write front left or center, front right, surround right, and so forth. Once you get them all labeled up, just gather those speaker wires and pull those over to the back of your AVR. Now that you have your speakers all wired up, let's get the subwoofers ready. On the rear of the Klipsch SPL120s, we'll set the first toggle switch to auto. This will allow the subwoofer to turn on when it senses a signal from the AVR. After you get your system up and running, if you find that your subwoofers don't turn on when the volume is low, you may want to change that switch from auto to on. If you have your subwoofers on the front wall like I do, you'll typically set the phase to zero. Some subwoofers have a variable phase to change anywhere between zero and 180 degrees. The SPL 120s have only a zero degrees or a 180 degree setting. If you have one in the front of the room and the other in the rear, you may find that you get better bass with one of the subwoofers phase set to 180 degrees. Feel free to listen to it both ways to see what sounds best at your main listening position. Now, of course, you can verify which is best using Room EQ Wizard and a calibrated microphone, but that's a more complicated topic for another video. The next knob on the subwoofer is the low pass filter. Your subwoofer may refer to that as a crossover. The low pass filter just simply tells the subwoofer what frequencies it's allowed to play or pass through it. 
Subwoofers are designed by nature to only play low frequencies. If you set it too high, you'll begin to hear voices coming through the subwoofer, which that's not ideal. 80 Hz is a good starting point. If you set it to 80 Hz, it's only going to play frequencies from 80 Hz down. Now I recommend setting your low pass filter as high as it will go or to the LFE like we have here. Now what this basically does is bypass the internal crossover of the subwoofer. The reason why we want to do this is that we're going to be setting the crossover inside the AVR instead of using the built-in crossover of the subwoofer. You wouldn't want to set the crossover on the back of the subwoofer to say 80 hertz, but then also set the same 80 hertz crossover inside your AVR. You're basically duplicating the crossovers and that's never a good thing. We'll connect a subwoofer or sometimes referred to as a digital coax cable to each subwoofer, which will later be connected to the AVR. If your subwoofer has an LFE input like we have here, on the Klipsch SPL120, simply plug the subwoofer cable into it. If your subwoofer does not have an LFE input, use a Y adapter to split that signal into two RCAs and connect one to the red and the other to the white RCA input. Now I recommend leaving the subwoofer's power cable unplugged until we get everything hooked up to the AVR. Now that we've got all of our speaker cables connected to each speaker and our subwoofer set up and connected, Let's take a look at the back of the AVR. To make it easier to see for you in this video, we'll start at the bottom and work our way up. First, we'll connect the RCA cable from the left subwoofer to the sub one pre-out. We'll do the same with the RCA cable from the right subwoofer and connect it to the sub two pre-out. When movie studios mix a movie, there's only really one LFE channel for the low frequency effects the AVR is sending the same LFE signal to both of those subwoofers. But many AVRs now have independent sub outs so that they can have independent control of the levels for each subwoofer to make sure they're the same volume at your listening position. Now, if your AVR has only one sub out and you wanna connect two subwoofers, simply use a Y adapter to split that signal into two and connect one subwoofer to each end of that adapter. A pre-out is simply a non-powered connection that carries information to an amplifier. In this case, we're sending the low frequency effects from a movie from the AVR to the subwoofer. The subwoofer then uses its own internal amplifier to amplify that signal. Now, in addition to the two subwoofer pre-outs, this Pioneer also has pre-outs for each additional channel. Pre-outs allow you once again to connect an external amplifier to provide more power to each speaker. Now in this system, we're powering everything with the Pioneer's internal amplification, so we'll only be using the two subwoofer pre-outs. Now let's get all nine of our speakers connected. If you installed banana plugs, it could not get any simpler to connect. And if you added the labels that I talked to you about earlier in the video, it's gonna make it even easier. Banana plugs make it super fast to be able to connect each speaker to the AVR, plus it keeps everything super tidy and clean. If you have some like the Sewell banana plugs that I have here, it makes it super easy, barely an inconvenience. Oh, really? Now, if you're using bare wire, it's more of a tedious process. Now, take your time. Be absolutely sure that all the wires get inserted into the binding post and then secured tightly. You don't want any of those copper wires touching another speaker terminal, which could short out or even damage your AVR. Now the last step is to connect all of our sources and we're gonna be using HDMI cables. If you're a gamer, I recommend using HDMI 2.1 cables as they support 4K 120. If not, you can use cables that support up to 4K 60. Those are often referred to as like HDMI 2.0 cables. Now the good news is you don't have to go crazy and spend big money on fancy cables. Digital cables are zeros and ones. They either work or they don't. I've used Monoprice, SVS, and other HDMI cables. For long HDMI cable runs, like 25 foot or more, I recommend using active fiber optic HDMI cables. Most of the HDMI cables that I use in my theater room 
including a 50-foot run to my projector, is from Monoprice. They're inexpensive, and they've been reliable in my setup for years. Now, when possible, connect all of your components using the HDMI inputs. The Pioneer 505 allows up to six HDMI components. Now, in this system, we have an Apple TV 4K and a PS5 that we'll be connecting. I'll connect the Apple TV to HDMI 1 and the PS5 to HDMI 2. Now, sometimes AVRs like this Pioneer will allow you to rename the inputs so that you can go into the AVR and name, say, HDMI 1 to Apple TV and HDMI 2 to PS5. If you have an option to connect to your internet via an Ethernet cable, that's always the best option. Now, I don't have an Ethernet connection in my living room, so I'll be connecting that later via wirelessly inside the Pioneer setup. We'll connect the power cable, and we're done back here. Now, I have a comprehensive walkthrough on how to install an AVR that I've linked in the description below. Now that we have our speakers and components connected to the AVR, let's align our speakers. Now, I typically like to have the tweeter aimed somewhere slightly behind my listening position. Aiming your speakers towards your listening position is called toe-in. Now, not every speaker requires toe-in, so just play around to see what gives you the best sound. One thing I found is even small changes in that angle can make a huge difference in how they sound in your room. So be sure to play with those angles after you get everything set up to see what sounds best in your room. But for now, we're gonna go ahead and angle those towards my listening position. Also, make sure the right and left speakers are in line or slightly in front of your entertainment cabinet. This helps to reduce any unwanted sound reflection. Let's do the same with the center channel. Make sure that it's at the front edge of your cabinet to reduce any reflections. Now, something you may not have thought of is make sure that your tweeter in your center channel is aimed at your ears. If it's low on the floor or near the floor, make sure you angle it up. If it happens to be above your TV, make sure you angle that down. Now, I made a dedicated video on tips to improve the dialogue of your center channel that also is in the description below. If you have only two side surrounds, Dolby recommends placing them from 110 degrees to 120 degrees. If you're using side surrounds and back surrounds, you would place the side surrounds as shown in this diagram. Now, due to the position of my couch, I need to have the surrounds at about 90 degrees. It's best to be as close to Dolby's recommended layout but sometimes your room will just simply not allow for the exact placement, so we have to work with what we have. Let's plug in our power cables to our subwoofers and we are good to go. Now that you have everything set up, you'll wanna run your AVR's room correction software like Odyssey, Dirac Live, Arc, YPAL, or whatever's available in your AVR. Now this is a lengthy process and it actually varies depending on what room correction software you're using. I recently made a video on how to set up Dirac Live, and I have a separate video on how to set up using Odyssey. I bet by now you can guess where you can find links to those videos. The room correction software will take measurements of your room, add EQ, set recommended crossovers for each speaker, set delay and levels for each speaker so that they play at the same volume at your listening position. Now, I recommend using an SPL meter or an SPL app on your phone to verify and check that those levels are accurate for each speaker. Once you watch a few movies, you may find that you want to hear more of a certain speaker like your subwoofers. Feel free to go back into your AVR and, and increase those levels a little bit, but just don't go overboard. I recommend not going above 0 dB on your speaker levels as you run the risk of adding distortion or possibly even damaging your speakers. I find that Odyssey sets my subwoofers way too low for my taste. I typically go back into the AVR and increase the subwoofer channels about five to six dB after calibration. The goal is to have a well-balanced immersive experience. You really don't want any particular speaker or subwoofer to be noticeably louder than the other speakers. I made a dedicated video on how to level match your speakers that I posted down in the description as well. 
Now, I know this was a long video, but I hope it inspires you to build a home theater in your space, whether you've got a dedicated theater room like I have, maybe a bedroom, a garage bonus room, or a living room like I do here in my home. And if you found value in this video, be sure to like and subscribe. I have over 720 videos on the channel to help you get the most out of your home theater. Now, if you have specific questions about your home theater, consider becoming a patron where you'll be able to message me directly and join me for monthly Zooms. As mentioned before, I've got links to every product and resources mentioned in this video down in the description below. So head to there now and check those out. As always, be blessed and I will catch you in the next video.